Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So Mark, thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. I'm really pleased to have you. Um, before we get uh, stuck into the, the sort of the details of Bali, could you sort of give us a little bit of a background about yourself and how you came to um, be, become an expert in, in Bali? That's a long story, but very briefly. Um, when I, I got a position at Cambridge, an undergraduate, um, my parents, being narrow-minded, had the idea that I should be a doctor or something like it. And so my scholarship to Trinity Cambridge was actually in the natural sciences. But I wanted to do something more interesting as well. And at Cambridge, you could do medicine and have a free, a third of your time free. So I said, I want to do anthropology. And the um, faculty of medicine said, no, you can't. We, when we say you can do something else, it has to be a serious subject. Now, I've always been something of a contrarian. And when somebody tells me that that doesn't count as serious, I'm inclined to say, up yours. Mm -hmm. So I switched and did anthropology. And I have never regretted. Every time I've ever had to go and see a doctor, I think, thank God I didn't. <laughs> so it's, it's so like not being hard-headed. Sorry? I said, you started off being hard-headed and you ended up in anthropology. I ended up in anthropology. Then when I graduated, I thought, hold on, do I want to do this for a livelihood? I've never been to any of these places. So I was interested in Southeast Asia, Chinese. It was an interesting part of the world. And I wrote to various universities and said, wouldn't you love to have me? And they all wrote back in due course saying yes, because it was a short one or two year tenure. They didn't have to put this through committees. If mm -hmm. they had the spare cash, they could just have me. So Singapore was first. And I had to teach the collected works of Clifford Geertz as part of my teaching. Okay. And when I read it, I thought, this is most unlikely. Mm -hmm. And so I went to uh, uh, it Bali. That was just after the massacres of 1965, 66, and flights were rare, and often they, they were co-opted by the military. But I got there, and it was intriguing because nobody had been able to study there for 15 years because wow. of the, the lead up to the, um, uh, uh, the massacres. Uh, Indonesia, in effect, being closed because of a battle between the communists of Russian or Chinese persuasion and the uh, American-backed military. Mm -hmm. So it was an empty territory. So I looked around the world. There was only one place that was uh, I could study Bali, and that was at Sir School of Oriental and African Studies, where the one world's remaining expert on Bali was. So. Mm -hmm. I went to SOAS, and I've been trying to escape ever since. I mean, you mentioned that you studied the work of Gitz, and, and you, you were shocked by what you read, or you were kind of, yeah. I don't know, doubtful of what you read. Yeah. Well, where did that doubt come from? Well, um, at Cambridge, I'd had some excellent South Asian anthropologists teaching me. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that there were all sorts of South Asian elements about Bali, Indian, Indian philosophical and cultural ideas that Geertz was systematically denying. Mm -hmm. And I thought, mm -mm. and also his portrayal of these people sounded most unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So it his sounded, portrayal of that, they're, they're extremely sort of timid and, and yeah. polite. Also, um, the, uh, in a sense, in part, one has to understand Cliff Gertz, who I got to know quite well. Cliff is a, was a very shy man, and so he lived very much in his head and in a world of ideas. 
His first job was teaching the Romantic philosophers. And so he had this a very idealized uh, uh, vision of Indonesia. And he wrote, uh, and in fairness to him, it was a brilliant account, if you want a synthesis. If you want all these ideas woven together into what is a singularly European vision mm. of um, how the world is, as the Romantic philosophers did. Now, against that, I tend to be analytical. I like taking things apart. Mm-hmm. And so the moment I saw this synthetic vision, I said, hold on, there must be other ways of looking at this. And so in a sense, I've spent the last 40 years doing that. That's really interesting. I think, I mean, it's, it's fascinating that, that you sort of had a, an inclination towards the, the idea of being wrong and then really dived into it. And one of the things that really sort of caught me off guard, particularly because I'm, I'm sort of completely oblivious to, to Bali's background, is the fact that you mentioned earlier on that um, Bali wasn't, this is a PR campaign that makes Bali this, this you know, this heaven or this getaway, um, when in reality it used to be a dangerous place. This is, uh, this is actually a very interesting history. And as I said, a colleague of mine has written very nicely about it. Um, uh, the name is Adrian Vickers, and he wrote a book called Bali, A Paradise Created, which is available as a Kindle book, actually. It's, uh... Now, the, the point is that Bali was famous before it was even discovered. How can that be? The point is, Europeans thought that paradise, Eden, was a place on Earth. Mm-hmm. And part of the early explorations, when Vasco da Gama was going round India, it wasn't on some amazing voyage of discovery. He was trying to find the spice route. They wanted to get hold of and monopolize the spice trade. Mm-hmm. So that was one element. The other element was they were looking for paradise. Okay. And they found paradise. It was in Goa. Okay. And it still is. I mean, you know, there was something today, today in the newspapers about the man running for a, a, a political office in Goa wants to keep the siesta because it's all part of Goa's special magic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in the course of this, uh, a Dutch ship landed on North Bali. And when they got back to Holland, they announced publicly in newspapers, we've discovered it, we found paradise. Because um, Bali had complex irrigation, and the Dutch, these early Dutch sailors seeing this, thought that, uh, imagine these were dikes. And so they thought it was just like Holland, you see, that Uh Bali had to have big dikes to keep the sea out. It's a volcanic island. It goes straight up out of the sea. But... The early, the there were books came out about Bali. There was nothing. These were pictures of Go and princes paintings that were recycled on Bali. Wow, right. And so for uh, then, as people got to know more about Bali, it stopped being paradise, and for several hundred years it was hell. Balinese traditionally had very little interest in the arts or culture. They were warriors. Okay. They ran the slave trade, the massive slave trade to Batavia, now Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, was run by Balinese who went right through eastern Indonesia, um, capturing slaves, putting them on boats and shipping them and selling them in Java. Okay. And they were, uh, the Dutch didn't conquer Bali because first there were no great natural resources there. The, uh, The Dutch were exploitative. And also, um, the, the Balinese were ferocious fighters. Mm-hmm. They were mercenaries. They would hire themselves out, you know, just for a good punch-up. Mm-hmm. And then finally, in the first decade of the 20th century, the Dutch decided, right, we're, clean, we're mopping up. And so they set out to conquer Bali. Then all hell broke loose, because Bal- the Balinese aristocracy, faced with the onslaught of the Dutch, and Indonesian troops were uh, fighting for the Dutch, instead of capitulating, committed mass suicide in wow. front of the Dutch. Wow. In almost all of the kingdoms, because for them, that was the end of the world. 
And so to Balinese, the mess that has progressively come upon Bali, the millions of tourists walking around half naked and so on, all this is simply living proof that it is the end of the world has happened. And after that, you just get rubbish as now. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask you about that point? Um, can, you, can you sort of talk us through, I mean, uh, presumably you've read lots of accounts of, of this incident. Could you mm -hmm. talk us through a bit of the details of, of how this mass suicide took place? Right, yeah. Well, basically, each of uh, the North Bali was conquered slightly earlier, but South Bali remained. And then, as the Dutch launched attacks on one kingdom after another, initially, the Balinese went out to fight. But this was a rather uneven fight. Although they had um, uh, firearms, there were relatively few of them. Although I interject there a curious point, the Dutch actually, for uh, over, well over 100 years, had their long ba bore uh, rifles bored in Bali because Balinese blacksmiths were better at um, boring than European blacksmiths. So, in fact, Balinese were being shot at with weapons that they had produced. But anyway, the sheer size and scale of the invasion force was too much. And then finally, in each instance, when the um, Balinese realized that the aristocracy realized they could no longer hold out, the king, his wives, and children came out from the palace, uh, approached the, Balne the Dutch army, and then proceeded to stab themselves to death. The um, women stabbed their children first and then themselves, and then the Balinese kings would just um, stab themselves to death with their chrises. And this happened on three or four different um, kingdoms, one after the other. The Dutch response was, of course, um, they, they set about looting and all the things you normally expect. Uh, this is how uh, the Dutch museums have such excellent stuff. However, there was a backlash, because the, but this was the age of the camera, and photographs were telegraphed back to, the, to Europe, and they spread around the world. And the Dutch mm -hmm. had real trouble. Mm -hmm. They were personae non grata. They, th this, in the 20th century, was in, in, uh, inexcusable. Mm -hmm. And so they hit on a PR campaign. Well, you know, you've seen it with Brexit. You can sell people almost anything, provided Absolutely. you um, sell it cleverly enough. And so they decided to go back to the old image of Bali as paradise. Bare-breasted women and so on. In other words, it was exotic. It was the antithesis of Europe. Mm -hmm. It was the antithesis of conventional civilization. Wow. And... For between the uh, for between uh, 1917 and 1939, Bali was the world center for the production of erotic photos. Wow! I mean, it's it's a like really, a European export to them. Yeah, uh, no Europeans would all go there to photograph Balinese bare-breasted. Wow. Um, it was yes, it was a, a repulsive. Trade. So it was it was like a systemic degradation of of a culture. Exactly. That is, that is, uh, it, I mean, it, it's, it's, the fact that this is not common knowledge is scares me. You know, yeah. the fact that you know it takes for me to speak to an expert who's you know spent his life's work on Bali to tell us this information is quite remarkable in that their campaign has been incredibly successful because Bali is now synonymous with like, especially on social media, it's synonymous with like, you know, your Westerners, you know, posing um, almost naked on, on, you know, different beaches and poses and that sort of stuff. So doesn't that speak to the fact that their sort of PR campaign, the Dutch PR campaign was incredibly successful? Yes, it was. It, interestingly, Balinese, uh, ha, there are two or three aspects of this. The most popular area in all Bali for tourism from way back is a place called Kuta, which is just near the airport, right at the south. Now, Kuta was the only place in Bali that foreigners were allowed to settle early on, 
because it was considered deeply polluting. It had a reputation for uh, being r ritually polluting. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that, uh, so when tourism began, the fact that foreigners rushed there and proceeded to do all the things that Balinese considered disgusting was a wonderful proof of just how primitive foreigners were. Mm -hmm. So to Balinese, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, look, they all rushed there. You know, they really are savages. Wow, that is so, that's so incredible that, that they sort of, it, it was, it was, it was almost something that they prophesied, and it happened. Mm. Now, to give you an example, I, I, in, in Bali, I had to have a driver and, and so on. First, it was dangerous. My driver was a bodyguard as well. But uh, if I ever wanted to go to Kuta to visit, just to see what on earth was going on, I was an anthropologist, how were things changing? He would say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't go. The, the road's up today. I was just speaking to another chauffeur. And of course, the road wasn't up. But he absolutely refused to allow me to go to Kuta. And why was that? It was too filthy. Um, uh, I, uh, I shouldn't be subjected to having to look at stuff like that. Uh -huh. I was a serious student of Bali. I didn't, uh, it, it was, uh, I mean, uh, if, you, if you're going to ask somebody to visit, you don't go and show them your septic tank is the first thing that you show them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's crazy. And, and, and I think one of the things that really shocks me about, about all these conversations um, and, and sort of the, the insights that you've had is the fact that it, the way things have been shaped in Bali and the way sort of even the Balinese have, I suppose, um, leveraged the, the, the beauty of the, the natural sort of beauty is really playing into this, an incredibly vulgar Western colonial idea. And, and the idea that, you know, that was, it was the end of the world for those princes and, and they killed themselves. And there was a the birth of this, you know, Western garbage of an island. Um, what, what does that, from, from a social, from an anthropologist perspective, what does that do to the culture of, of the Balinese people? That's very interesting and complicated. And that, of course, is what I'm, in a sense, is the big problem that drives my, much of my work. Uh, first of all, Bali is changing and would be changing anyway. Yeah. And it, uh, although tourism has been a massive factor, there have been two other big factors. The first is Indonesia has been involved in some very extensive national development campaigns. And these have been pretty successful. Indonesia is, on the whole, one of the unspoken success stories of modernization. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an archipelago 3,000 miles long, 1,500 miles from north to south. It's massive. Mm -hmm. um, and get, uh, uh, managing to produce uh, cons uh, relatively consistent development across that is a big business. Mm -hmm. And so it, it isn't just tourism. That was one um, aspect. Another one, and this was very important for me, was the emergence of television. Uh, very early on, the Indonesian government decided to launch a one of the, I think it was the first commercial satellite, um, I think anywhere in the world, it was called Palapa, um, designed to be able to beam television throughout the archipelago. And at the time, it was considered rather akin to Nkrumah, who had a gold bed made for himself and so on. This was vanity. It wasn't. The people behind this were Berkeley-trained economists, and they knew exactly what they were doing. The only way to keep Indonesia as an archipelago, 300 major languages, endless different societies, was by creating an imaginary of them being Indonesian. They didn't think of themselves as Indonesian. Oh, wow. They had no common religion, no common anything. Indonesia has all the major religions in the world there. And so television was designed to create a, a sense of Indonesia. And so government put a television set in every village in Indonesia, obviously in many cases powered by um, car batteries. 
Mm. And I, I turned up um, in 1988 and um, uh, I w went around. Normally, when I turned up, I would basically have food and drinks and people would come pouring in and chat. Mm -hmm. I didn't interview. With, I very, very rarely worked one-to-one -one because Balinese don't work one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, doing what we're doing at the moment, which is a one-to-one -one interview, yeah. is a strange thing. Basically, that would only happen if you were being interrogated by the police or military intelligence. Okay, okay. And so Balinese worked in groups and chatting. So I worked in that way, and I was writing notes and uh, tape recording, you know, cassette recording. And suddenly, this time, nobody turned up. I thought, oh dear, have I done something wrong? Mm -hmm. so I went off, and they were all watching television. Oh, wow. Suddenly, it was something more interesting than me. And so I realized, before then, Barney's had absolutely no interest in the outside world. I would, t when I first went there, the only question they asked was, where you come from, do you grow rice? Mm. And if I said no, they would say, well, well, we do here, we grow wonderful rice, they okay. do. And occasionally then I would say, well, uh, yes, uh, we do. And they, Is it as good as ours? No. Well, that, that shows. <laughs> End of question. No interest whatsoever. And even when uh, occasional tourists it turned up, no, they didn't care. But when television arrived, oh, so that's what it's like where you come from. And suddenly there were all these questions. Okay. Suddenly the, the vision of the world was changed. There's an old Indonesian proverb, um, like a frog under half a coconut shell. Mm. So the little frog is under the coconut shell. He looks at it. He thinks that's the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And one day somebody comes and kicks over the co coconut shell, and the frog sees the size of the world, and he dies of shock. <laughs> <laughs> and so for Balinese, the biggest single thing was television. Mm. Wow. Now Balinese uh, are Hindu. Uh, this was it, 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 the idea of Hindu versus uh, Muslim in Indonesia has been massively overrated. Pre, uh, traditionally, um, the uh, Balinese uh, Hindu princes would ally themselves with Javanese uh, Muslim princes to fight somebody else. It, yeah. That was, you know, what your religion was was uh, another business. Mm -hmm. But um, with television, it appeared that uh, suddenly the world was seen differently and the Gulf War, the first Gulf War happened. Okay. And this was fascinating because Balinese, who had be, were being made to feel somewhat under threat from Islam in Java, mm -hmm. their attitude was fascinating. They were so horrified by these weapons and their capacity to kill people. It wasn't the religion that mattered. It was the humanity that mattered. Mm. And they thought that, uh, uh, that was deeply anti-Western. It was, you mean to say that these people are just dropping weapons that melt people like that? Wow. And so it was the shared humanity that came out that was really touching. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that note, can I, can I ask you a little bit about sort of that aspect of Balinese culture? Because you said they were historically warriors. And... You know, they 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 had been in in sort of involved in the slave trade and, and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. How, where did they sort of did they soften up after the the colonization? Not really. No. Um, when I was there, Bali is very interesting because again we we talk about the idea of a state. We think of Britain or. Pakistan or India or wherever, as a nation state. It doesn't work in uh, an archipelago because there's just all these islands. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, I've just, wait a minute, I've lost my train of thought for a second. Um, 
Now, what was I saying? Um, I, was, I was asking about um, how after the colonization... Uh, right, that's right, yeah. Uh, so the idea here was that you don't have a unitary Indonesia, you don't even have a unitary Bali. Every village had its own way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And they defended this ferociously. While I was there, three people in neighboring villages were executed by the village because they broke village regulations. Mm -hmm. In one instance, a, a, a man stole a sewing machine from another villager. Now, this was a big business because this was a man's livelihood. He was a tailor. Yeah. And having he was a habitual thief. And they went and uh, were going to grab him. But the police had got there first. And he was taken to the police station. Now, this police station happens to be just on the turn in on the road to Ubud, which is one of Bali's great tourist centers. It's famous for its art and dancing and so on. Mm -hmm. What most people don't know is what happened there um, while, during my first field work. The village turned up in strength, all armed at the police station, and they said, hand him over. We will produce justice. And the police said, no, no, this is the Indonesia. We're the police. We take over. I said, no, you don't. I said, the police said, we're armed. I said, and there are many more of us. How many of us do you think you'll kill before we kill you? Hand him over. So they did, and he was torn limb from limb on the spot. Wow. And tourists stopped there and said, oh, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> These uh, Balinese. Why was the response so aggressive to like theft? It was that just the the, the culture? Was that just? It, it, he had he uh, um, he had betrayed the community. Okay, okay. He had gone against the core values. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, the death sentence in Bali was uh, uh, excommunication, not in the Christian sense, but nobody would have anything to do with that person. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't speak to them. You wouldn't give them food. They became a non-person. Mm -hmm. And they just, uh, they just wandered around and sooner or later somebody just stabbed them to death. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they made, uh, uh, this was a very strong idea of community and it was enforced violently. In fact, even to this day, in the village I work, there are different wards in it. And every year, two of the wards proceed to have a good old punch-up. Okay. That fun. <laughs> Don't ask me why they do it. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just their culture. That's that's known to them. Oddly enough, it isn't just there. Um, I had a student, one of the very first people to do ethnographic, proper ethnographic fieldwork in China. Mm. Um, and uh, he wrote to me saying, it's extraordinary. Half the villagers were coming back from work when the other half leapt out of the a ditch with big sticks and beat them up. He said, what for? And, and they said, well, we just felt like it. So in <laughs> other words, all sorts of things are going on that are not reported in the media. And of course, governments and politicians don't want to be thought of as this isn't how we do things. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and that's understandable. But then... Then what does that do to the, the, the heritage of a place? What does that do to the, the, the sort of the, the real narrative of the, of the island? This is now very interesting because, of course, you, you're quite right. It's about narratives. And the, uh, the Indonesian government and Balinese government are very busy producing a narrative about this island of this artistic island of gentle, laughing people. Incidentally, Balinese never smile in daily life mm. among themselves. Why the only time you smile is if you're going to a court or to see somebody extremely powerful. Then you put on basically a shit-eating grin. Okay. You don't smile. You walk around a bar in these villages. The only people who ever smile are the unmarried, young kids who simply don't have a care in the world. Uh -huh. um, smiling indicates that you have met somebody powerful who you think can do good to you. And that's why I can remember asking my wife, I was thinking about it, I said, hold on, 
why do Balinese smile at foreigners? Is it because they think they can uh, help them? He said, of course, why else would we smile at them? Uh, so amongst themselves, there's no smiling? No. Why would you smile? So it, does that then, does that translate into them having a very sort of serious social life? Oh, Balinese have a wonder, like almost all Indonesians, have a magnificent sense of humour. Oh, okay. That's laughing, that's different. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Uh, but that's on an occasion sparked by something. Mm -hmm. And it can be quite cruel. Uh, Balinese um, uh, are very sensitive about body and body posture and movement. Mm -hmm. This is exemplified in dance, of course. But people who are crippled, for example, are just laughed at. Mm -hmm. it's, not a kind, it's not a kind place. Mm -hmm. My wife was fascinated at uh, how well we treated people who were physically disabled or handicapped in some yeah. kind of way. Mm -hmm. And she was very impressed. She said, I wish they would uh, uh, be more like this in Indonesia or in mm -hmm. Bali. Um, so um, they, they're, they're tough but they have a wonderful sense of humor. And again, this sensitivity to the physical is extraordinary. Um, an old friend of mine was a Time Life and National Geographic photographer. And he said he'd been able to photograph anywhere in the world without being observed if he really went about it. One way is you sit in a car with the window open, but you sit back and have a long telephoto lens. He tried it in Bali, and he said, even with somebody a kilometre away working a rice field, they'd spot him within a few seconds. And why is that? They're trained to visual acuteness. Okay. And indeed, this same man was, um, uh, he, uh, he had two 16 millimetre cameras, one in each pocket, he was a big man. Um, and he was out filming, and he couldn't find something, and he asked the uh, Balinese who was accompanying him, said, okay, but hold on, um, what are you looking for? And he said, well, it looks like this. He said, you put it in your top right-hand pocket a quarter of an hour ago, and there it was. The, my wife does the same. She continually astounds me. Oh, but you put it there three and a half weeks ago. You put it in this place. Where, where does that come from, do you think? It's training. They, are, uh, they learn to be extremely visually acute. Uh, it, it was the, the, is that born out of a necessity? Or? I don't know. It certainly, uh, uh, what it does link to is ideas of knowledge. How do we know things? Mm -hmm. And Balinese ideas of knowledge are, actually are in part derived from Indian Samkhya, or at least they, they parallel them neatly. Um, the most reliable knowledge is direct witnessing. Okay. The next most reliable knowledge is inference. Mm -hmm. The least reliable knowledge is having heard or read something. All uh, right. And it depends on the expertise and the reliability of your source. So, whereas we we say, if somebody tells, if somebody says, you know, uh, Boris Johnson has done this, we tend to say Boris Johnson has done this. We don't know. Mm -hmm. We somebody told you they'd heard it on television, so yeah. we don't know. Mm -hmm. What do I know about Boris Johnson? What do I know about Donald Trump? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Everything has been told by somebody. But in Bali, if some, uh, so if you didn't actually witness it, you don't say, oh, so-and-so did such and such. You say, so-and-so told me that they had seen so-and-so do such and such. Oh, okay, so you have to be very specific. Very careful. Mm. And I made endless mistakes at the beginning with this, of course. I would say, oh, well, said, how do you know? I said, oh, so-and-so. Oh, so you'll be interrogated if you, if you said something. Yeah. If, if they thought it was unrealistic, if you didn't have direct e witnessing um, experience of it, no. Let me ask you, tell me one of the most sort of fascinating things that you've, you've spent all this time and, and so much of your life's work in Bali. What's one of the most sort of fascinating takeaways that you, you've sort of taken away from the, from the island? Um, 
it's something antithetical. Mm -hmm. First, just how much people differ culturally, and at the same time, just how much humans have in common at the same time. Mm -hmm. Both, they're contradictory and they're both true. Mm -hmm. But you have to learn, um, the, uh, anthropology in a way is getting to understand how people themselves experience and think about their worlds insofar as you can. Now, you never can fully. Mm -hmm. I'm not Balinese. And the, uh, the point is, it doesn't matter if I'm living in a village and um, uh, something terrible is going on. I know I can always get an air ticket out of there. They can't. Mm -hmm. They're stuck there. And so it's, the, it's this challenge of trying always to understand how people think about and experience their world. And that's why I focused on argument. Mm. Because through argument, you start to understand. And that's the next, if you ask me what I've taken away, that's the next thing, that there is no society where everybody thinks the same way. We happily talk. You, if you read about Bali or about Java or about India, or, oh, Indians think. Who is there a billion people? <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> Absolute nonsense. It, every single person has a rather different take on things. They also have a different take on things on different occasions in different contexts. It depends when you ask them in, in, in what, you know, what's going on. And all, this is one of the things that pushed me towards cultural studies, was in cultural studies, we reckon three great divisions of society by race or ethnicity, gender, and class. Mm. And so, in other words, the very idea that Balinese all think one thing ignores the fact there are men and women, there are Balinese of different class, and so on. And so the idea that everybody's going to think the same way is a Western imaginary. Mm. We like to think other people are nice and simple. That to say all British think, I mean, you know, you just get a belly laugh in mm. reply, and quite rightly too. Mm -hmm. The complexities, Black Lives Matter, the whole, uh, you know, finally we're beginning to wake up to the fact, yes, it's glorious. We live in a wonderful, but this is a serious sense of multicultural. There are differences and similarities that cross cut in an intricate way. Mm -hmm. And this is true of everywhere in the world. But we like to imagine other places are simple and straightforward. They're not. That is, I mean, that's, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. And I think I haven't heard a more sort of eloquent description of it because this really is a problem in that we, we want to simplify a really complex world. We want to, you know, make these sort of easy go-to um, patterns that we can sort of try to build our models around, which is in large part nonsense. Yeah. And it's a nonsense that's fostered by politicians in the country in question. Mm. I mean, we say there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. There are lies, damn lies, and political lies. Mm -hmm. um, politicians are totally unscrupulous, almost always. I'm, I struggle to think of an honest politician. It's almost a contradiction in terms. Yeah. And we then, uh, I mean, why on earth? I mean, Britain is selling arms to some of the most unpalatable countries in the world. Absolutely. How, how is this per permissible? Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is why I'm interested in the mass media. How, is, how can people be made docile enough to accept this and not feel utterly repulsed and to make this a priority in their voting? Mm. This is just common humanity. Absolutely. I think, well, I think that part, one, of the thing, one of the things that's troubling for me, having spent so much time researching what academics look at and, you know, finding interesting characters for the show is that you do have sort of, you know, really 
socialist attitudes towards these issues. But then the, the, the sort of counter argument to that is that, oh, those are the non-serious universities or those are the non-serious uh, thinkers. Let's go back to the real world. This is, the real, this is how the world is. And this is the problem that I'm sort of, I mean, I, I'm sure this is something that you as, a, as an anthropologist can, um, I guess, maybe have come across or, or, or can sort of break down in a bit more detail. Yeah, well, in fact, this is one of the great strengths of cultural studies and one of the reasons that, I, although I'm still an anthropologist, I make lots of use of cultural studies. It's the notion of articulation. Mm. Now, articulation means that you link things together in a particular constellation and you present that as the way the world is. And really powerful articulations are what we call hegemonic. Where the term comes from Gramsci, but it's become popular. Oh, um, and so if you can convince people that something is uh, hegemonic, your work is over. It's he hegemony is a much more efficient way of running a populace than having to resort to police and arms. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason of the collapse of the former Soviet Union is they were having to use spies and um, weapons to control their own population. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, capitalist world, we're much more efficient. We have the credit card. <laughs> you see, the point is, the moment you get a credit card, you're, you've got the idea you can buy things, you can do things. You're made captive by a little bit of plastic. Wow. That is your vision of yourself as a consumer with certain rights and so on and so forth. And... You, you control yourself, you, uh, in Foucault's terms, you, you survey yourself, you, um, and you discipline yourself. So uh, articulation is the idea that people spin good stories about how the world is. What is less noticed is that for any articulation, there is always a counter-articulation. There's mm -hmm. another way of putting the world together. Mm -hmm. And you see this between political parties. One political party articulates something one way. Um, so, you know, the Conservatives at the moment are talking about sovereignty. Mm. What does sovereignty mean? It's, a, it's a, 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 as vacuous a term as democracy. Look, North Korea calls itself a democracy. Mm -hmm. And the former East Germany, a democracy. So, in other words, we have to be very careful. You get articulations and you get counter-articulations. But what interests me most as an anthropologist is a third and very neglected factor, disarticulation. Mm -hmm. Who is excluded and not able to articulate at all? Wow, this these is are the large part, of, in many cases, it's the most of the populace. Now, when I was working in Bali, the uh, long-distance truck drivers tend to be independent sort of characters. Mm -hmm. And on their mud flaps, they would put slogans. Mm -hmm. And one ran for years was called Koch Nomon. What's the point in talking? <laughs> it meant, even if we talk, no one is listening. Wow. And I was once interviewing, oh, not interviewing, I was, he was part of a, a group, when um, he said to me, he said, do you know why we like working with you? Because if we say something, nobody listens. If you say it for us, they listen. Mm. Um, and he, he was an intellectual. He was somebody they should have listened to, but his point was, I'm a villager. Nobody yeah. pays any attention, no matter how bright I am. But because you are an academic, because you can meet the governor of Bali, you know, if you give a lecture, the professors and uh, senior people turn up, they pay attention to you. You, you, how, you are articulate. We have been disarticulated. Wow. And just think of all the people in the UK who don't bother to vote because they feel so disarticulated. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating. This, uh, and so th then I understand from this then, those who, who want to maintain their control would sort of be, in, well, I guess be incentivized to have a larger portion of the public 
in this sort of realm of disarticulation. Yeah. If you can disart- they have no voice. They cannot speak. Or, as this man put it, even if we speak, no one listens. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's, it's almost as if they've, they've been sort of disregarded before they've even voiced anything. Exactly. They've been pre-disarticulated. They, they have been rendered mute. And uh, this, this I find really tragic. I happen to work on Bali, but it's equally true in the UK. It's true in France. It's true, I mean, you name any country in the world and the same goes, more or less. Uh, is there a possibility to remove people from this world of disarticulation? And get them that's, of indeed, that's the challenge. Mm-hmm. And uh, the point is that, again, um, I'm thinking of House MD, a television series. Mm-hmm. House is a great diagnostician. He doesn't always uh, have the exact remedy, um, as it were. I'm a diagnostician. Mm-hmm. The remedies, it, it's not for me to tell Indonesians or Pakistanis or Indians or Chinese how to solve their problems. W- what I can do is say, look, folks, this is going on. As people who are not part of this tiny elite, here is my analysis, my forensic analysis of the situation. If you are not happy with this, then think about it. This is where political activism and so on takes place. Um, I'm not a political activist because at the moment you become an activist, you sign up to one articulation. Absolutely. And my task is to stand back and to recognize that interplay and not to prioritize, but just to recognize that we, this is not a level playing field. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. This is, this is amazing, you know, an amazing insight and, and sort of the differentiation between these sort of um, concepts, articulation and, and counter-articulation and disarticulation speaks so much to... to the state of affairs in the UK. We don't need to go yeah. any further. I mean, just within our own little bubble and, and how the use of a word like sovereignty aroused so many emotions, you know, within people who were disenfranchised, but then they were they still remained disenfranchised. It was just with the, yeah. the emotions and the connotations that came with it. What what's really when you get really clever. Uh, take the example of uh, fishing at the moment and Brexit. Mm-hmm. Fishing, I, if I remember rightly, is worth less than one hundredth of the financial sector's dealings mm-hmm. with the EU. But it makes it, it appear we're dealing with ordinary real people. You can go and uh, the interview on television a fisherman and it sounds realistic and the man has a very good point. Um, going and interviewing a banker is far less effective. Yeah, absolutely. Yet, you know, uh, and of course, all this is a deeply cynical game because uh, in the end, uh, uh, finance will speak in quite what way. Uh, On the other hand, Brexiteers are ideologues and they are quite silly enough to go and kill the golden goose. Mm. I hope uh, I, I'm, I'm agnostic as, as to what will happen. It's going to be disastrous, whatever. But back to the point, you can you pick up people and you're using them not as real people. Mm. The politicians don't give a hoot about fishing. No, absolutely not. Why would they? Exactly. They're convenient. Uh, uh, Lenin used a nice term, useful idiots. <laughs> it's sad. But it's true. I mean, you know, but it's it's you know, this was a politician who knew what he was doing. But I mean, it's, it's like it's it's very telling, like with the the whole, you know, the the, the idea of of having a, a um, an articulation and then a, a counter articulation. The fact that you know Boris Johnson before he became prime minister, when he was sort of deciding which side he's going to be on, <laughs> the fact that he wrote both you know essays on both sides. Exactly. It just goes to show you, it's like, uh, I do what serves me. I, 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 I couldn't care less for the outcome. I have two different articulations, and I'll see which one looks like being the most effective <laughs> for what I want. But they rarely think through to the consequences of their articulations. What advice would you give to young people 
um, and people who are just starting their journeys in academia or, or perhaps in, in the world of anthropology or even politics. Um, what advice would you give to young people about sort of navigating this world and these articulations? Uh, I think to some extent they might have to follow to a degree what I did. I, um, well, after being, I had no great interest in the mass media or television. I didn't have a television set till I was 30. Um, uh, but being in Bali and seeing how much it had impacted on Balinese, I thought, right, I need to start reading about this. What does television do? And I read a book by a very famous uh, media scholar called John Fisk, and it was just called Television Culture. Mm -hmm. And in there was a chapter on television news. And I read that and I thought, wow, mm -hmm. how come I had never thought, I think of myself as a critical person, two thirds of that had never occurred to me until he spelled it out and then it was obvious. Mm -hmm. um, one of his points was that um, in, uh, in a sense, everything is pre-articulated for us. Um, he gave a lovely example of the uh, Belgian Congo. This was going back about 50 years. There were massacres taking place of Europeans there. And uh, a, an American journalist was flown in and arriving at Lusaka Airport, he rushed up to a group of uh, white women who were on the flight out. He came up to them and said, hello, is anyone here speaking English and being raped? <laughs> And Fisk said, the whole point is the story had already been written in America before he left. There was a template. All he was doing was picking up a bit of local color. Absolutely. And this is horrifyingly true. Mm. So I, I would say we live in a mass mediated age. You and I are speaking through a contemporary medium, an electronic medium, social media. Anybody who does not recognize that is basically living in a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. they're, they're nostalgically imagining that things are still face to face. Mm -hmm. Whereas everything, virtually everything is mediated. Stop and think, what do you actually know by direct experience or by inference from reliable sources? That's virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. And I've had, what, 15 PhD students working on television production and other kinds of media production in different countries around the world. And looking at how producers set about framing these articulations, that's the moment at which it gets done. Mm. And it's really an intriguing world. But back to your point, I think that a course if you're going to university, a course on media studies, just one, on critical media studies, what are the media doing to us and how are they doing it would be vital. Um, many years ago, Sheikh Yamani, when he was Saudi minister for oil, um, was asked what he considered the greatest contribution to world peace. His niece was studying anthropology at Oxford. And his reply was simple. He said, a year of anthropology should be, uh, social anthropology or cultural anthropology should be compulsory in every university degree in the world. Mm. No matter whether you were doing a natural science or not. I would say a course on critical media and cultural studies now fulfills a parallel function. Mm -hmm. It tells you what the bastards are doing to you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think he does... Spot on, you hit the nail on the head with that. And um, where can people get access to your your books, your works um, in general? It's all on my personal website. It's also available under Mark Hobart on that academic website, academia.edu. Yep. And it's also available for the general public on ResearchGate. Oh, I'll, I'll link all three, all three of these websites. I'll link yeah. on the show so people can can get instant access to them. Um, Mark, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you. I've, I've enjoyed it beyond um, anything else I've done this week. So um, oh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I hope that's more or less what you wanted. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Thank you for watching this video. 
Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.